Astronomy Cast, episode 248 from Monday, January 16th, 2012. The Carina Constellation. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hi, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good, good. So again, we are running this as this episode of Astronomy Cast as a live Google Plus Hangout. So if you want to watch us, you can watch us live as we record the episode and make all our mistakes. Uh, and that's and you can circle both you know me or Pamela on Google Plus, and and then you'll get a notification in your stream when we start the recording. But the plan right now is for us to record them every Monday at. Uh, all the times up again. <laughs> okay, uh, so at noon Pacific, uh, two Central, three Eastern, and eight PM in London. Yeah. And so that's every Monday. That's when we're going to try and record, but we'll tell you if we, we have to record at a different time because of Pamela's travel schedule. And usually we'll just shift to Wednesday, same time, same bat channel, just on Wednesday. Right. Right. And then it might just be that she's in. I don't know. China, and we're recording at 4 a.m. her time, but she's a professional and a trooper, so don't worry about it. Yeah, except the social medias just don't stream there so nicely. That's true. Um, all right. Okay, well, let's roll. So, time okay. for another detailed look at a constellation, one of the most fascinating in the sky, but hidden to most of the northern hemisphere, Carina. Uh, home to one of the most likely supernova candidates we know of, Eta Carina, Let's talk about this constellation, how to find it, and what you can discover in and around it. Now, you, now we were like planning this show and sort of talking about constellations, and you, this was like in your mind like the third good constellation to talk about. Why did you pick Carina? Um, it's one of those constellations that's just full of the good stuff. We we already did the Orion constellation, and in my mind, these two constellations sort of go together. Uh, they they don't thematically go together. You have Orion the Hunter. You have uh, Carina is the keel of the ship Argos Navi, which was the ship that the Argonauts took while they went to go get the Golden Fleece. Not so united there. But these two areas of the sky are two of the richest star-forming regions we have. And the thing is, it, here in the north, uh, we are always, Orion, 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 look at the Orion Nebula, isn't that awesome? But if you actually go to the southern hemisphere, the Carina Nebula just puts the Orion Nebula to shame. It's, it's bigger, it's brighter, and it has one of the brightest stars in the sky, and it's one of the few stars in the sky that attempted to go supernova and failed, and that alone makes it kind of awesome. So if you had to choose between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, which one would you pick? Oh, man. Um, if you could only look at one hemisphere's constellations and objects, which one would you choose? A am I allowed to say I want to live on the equator? <sighs> sure. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Fine. So, Back so my I question. Sure. <laughs> so I, I, I have to say that folks living in the Mediterranean area have some of the best views on the sky because they're far enough south that they get to see a fairly good view of Sagittarius. They get to see the beautiful tail of Scorpion high in the sky as compared to those of us who are a lot further north. Uh, they get to pick up on the Korean Nebula, um, but at the same time, they get to pick and choose the best of both hemispheres. Um, as you go further north, sure, you get the Big Dipper high in the sky. That's pretty awesome. As you go further south, sure, you get the Southern Triangle high in the sky. Pretty awesome. But the cool stuff luckily tends to be along the equator. All right, all right. Good, good answer. Uh, <laughs> weasel answer. Weasel, good weasel answer. No, okay, so then let's talk about the Carina. Um, now, you sort of gave us a, a bit of, of what its name means. So what does the Carina, what does Carina mean? It, it literally means keel of a ship. It's, it's Latin. This constellation used to actually be part of a, a much, much larger constellation car, called Argo Navis that, if it still existed, would be by far the largest constellation in the sky and would dwarf absolutely everything else. 
Um, but because it's so large, it's, it's a little bit unwieldy to use for astronomical purposes. So it got broken up into three different constellations. It got broken up into Carina, into Puppis, and into Vela. And each of these different parts represents a different part of the ship, where Carina is the keel, and Puppis is the poop deck, and Vela is the sails. So between all three of these, you, you have the ship from Jason and the Argonauts. And then what, if you looked at the constellation, what does it look like? Uh, does it look it, like the keel of a ship? Uh, no, it just kind of looks like this random shape of stars on the sky. It's not one of those constellations like, well, this is where Orion does win. Orion, you can actually see. It's a dude in the sky with a sword. Karina, no, it's just miscellaneous shape of stars. Yeah, and Sagittarius absolutely looks like a teapot. Yes, yeah. No question. Yeah, but it doesn't exactly look like the Greek figurine it was supposed to look like. Yeah. Um, all right, so, so, then, and so then if we were going to try and find it, where would we find it? If we're um, in the Southern Hemisphere, the lucky <laughs> some Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Well, actually, anyone who, who's south of about 30 degrees north of the equator, so anyone, uh, tropics, you're doing fine. Folks down Florida, south of Florida, you're doing fine. It's at 60 degrees south declination. So um, it's, it's going to be low on the horizon if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and progressively get higher up. It's a winter object for the folks in the Southern Hemisphere, so you want to go and look for it uh, June, July, August. Um, I've actually been able to see it in March while down in South Africa. And basically look away from the Milky Way for a big, bright, fuzzy bit, and there you're starting to find Karina. And if we were to take like the northern constellations that we're a little more familiar with, could we, you know, keep going, like, in some direction? I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, but that's going to require me to open a star chart, so this is... <laughs> don't worry, you can... Why don't, we, why don't we remove that question, because it wasn't that... Uh, that okay. Important. Yeah. Um, all right. Okay, well, that fuzzy bit. So, I mean, would that fuzzy bit be obvious? I mean, it's almost... I'll bet you people in the Southern Hemisphere see that big fuzzy bit and, and go, I wonder what that is, and I guess never... <laughs> look any further, right, or think about it. No, I, I'm, I'm sure some of, some of them go further than that. So the Southern Hemisphere is actually kind of chock full of fuzzy bits. Um, you have the large and small Magellanic clouds. You have the Carina Nebula. So the Carina Nebula, as far as fuzzy bits go, it, it's fairly similar to, to the Orion um, sword belt nebula region. Uh, it's bigger and it's a little bit brighter. But the thing that makes it stand out is the second brightest star in the sky for a while, um, Eta Carina. It's still one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's right in the middle of all of this glowing bit. And if you pull out a, a fairly good telescope or even with binoculars, you can start to tell that this really bright star is extended. And, and this is because Eta Carina um, is embedded in this amazing hourglass-shaped nebula of expanding gas and dust. And so is, is Eta Carina the, the brightest star in that constellation? Currently, and this is where things get confusing. Uh, it, if you've been listening to any of our prior shows on constellations, you know that normally, not always, but normally the brightest star in a constellation is Alpha, the constellation name. So you'd expect Alpha Carina to be the brightest star in the constellation. And if it's not, it's going to be hard to tell it apart from the star that actually is the brightest star in the constellation by eye. But with Eta Carina, when they were counting through the stars in that particular constellation, it was much fainter than it is today. But back in the 1800s, it underwent this amazing brightening until in 1841, it, it actually was the brightest thing out there for the Southern Hemisphere viewers. And at this point, it was undergoing this amazing nova activity. It, supernova is not the right word. Cataclysmic variable isn't the right word. It was this weird thing where the star almost exploded, but didn't. And in the process, gave off this amazing amount of light. It since faded periodically, brightened periodically, and it's currently back in one of its brighter phases. And so, and so it's definitely now the brightest star in the constellation? In the constellation, yes. And one of the brighter stars in the sky. Yes, yeah. which 
at a distance of 7,500 light years is kind of amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that star alone, I mean, it, that star alone is worthy of its own show. <clears throat> yeah. But, um, so, then, so then why don't you talk, so where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the other stars and sort of get back to the Carina Nebula? Usually we start with the stars themselves. And then, so, I mean, Carina, which we've talked about, Eta Carina, which is going to be sort of probably the bulk of the, this episode. But let's talk about some of the other stars in the constellation as well. Well, m most of the stars in this system aren't entirely worth noting. They're just everyday stars. The, the other star in this system that's actually worth paying attention to has the rather boring name of HD 93129A. Um, this is a, another O-type hypergiant. Um, and it's out there basically saying, hey, um, you know, when other stars in the system explode, I might be following on their footsteps. This is a system that has very young stars, and this is, this is another one of them. Um, now, while it has that long, boring name, it has another name you might be more familiar with, and this is Canopus. It has a magnitude of minus 0 0.72, which makes it um, another one of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, I think it's the second brightest after Sirius. Yeah. 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 So this is, this is the quintessential Alpha Carini. Um, when it was named, it was the brightest star in the constellation. Uh, it's just Ada likes to be all competitive and threaten to explode at a younger age. Right, right. Um, and then what are some of the other, the other objects? I, mean, I, I guess, actually, you know what, I'm going to start that question again. Okay. All right, so, so really the two main stars that we should think about are, are Canopus and Eta Carina. Right. So, so then let's talk about some of the other things to view in that, in that constellation. I guess we, there's no avoiding it. The most interesting <laughs> thing in there is the, is the Carina Nebula. Right. So, so beyond that, the, this, this system, when we say Carina Nebula, we mean the great star-forming region that has the Eta Carina Nebula, the homunculus is, is what it's often referred to, the, the man um, embedded within it. But the, the great star-forming region, it's what's called an H2 region. This is ionized hydrogen. It's giving off beautiful red light. And embedded within this entire star forming complex are eight different open clusters. These are areas where fragments of the cluster have condensed down, or fragments of the nebula rather, have condensed down to form clusters of stars. These are sort of what the Pleiades uh, looks like, except they're much, much younger. Some of these systems are just three to four million years in age. Um, we've identified eight different open clusters within this system. And what's amazing is when you look at the great Carina Nebula and its embedded open clusters in X-ray light, you can see all of these little pinpricks of light that are representing the places where supernovae have gone off in the not too distant past. This, this is a system that's basically popping like popcorn, but with supernovae. And that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. And so then how big in the sky is it? If you could... You know, how many degrees of, of sky does the whole Carina Nebula take up? It's it basically go out and multiply the moon by seven, and, and you're starting to, to get a sense of just how big on the sky this entire region is. Physically, it's about 10 parsecs across. So this is a large system in terms of it, its physical extent, Sort of. I, mean, I don't know if you consider uh, that many light years particularly big. That's about 30 light years. Uh, but in terms of angular size in the sky, it's pretty big too. And so how, and how far away is it? It's it, ranging on where you're looking at in the system. It's 65,000 to 10,000, sorry, 6,500 to 10,000 light years away. So then how would you compare the state of this nebula to the Orion Nebula that we mentioned before? How do they, how do they compare in terms of sort of size and age and power? So, so Carina is actually a bigger system. Uh, they're very similar in age, actually. They both have ongoing star formation going on. The, the difference is when you, you look through Orion, um, you don't see as many rich open clusters as you see with Carina. What's interesting is how many parallel studies are done between these two systems where they can use them to confirm one another. So back in the early 2000s, there was this 
fabulous Hubble, Hubble study that looked at knots in both of these nebulae to identify stars in the process of forming. So these are star forming uh, pupils, uh, proplets rather. And so you can see these little caterpillar-like structures where stars are forming, or comet-like structures is how some people have also described them, uh, embedded in the gas. And these are places where stars are just now starting to form and will soon be burning off that thick gas around them to, to reveal themselves as the young stars that they are. And, and those open clusters that we can see, those are ones that have already a little, a little older, have cleared out some of the gas and dust and exactly. starting to separate out. Yes, and, and just imagining what it would be like in these systems, you're, you're getting, in some cases, hundreds of stars within the same region that we and our nearest 10 neighbors occupy. So these are much, much denser regions of space. Oh, it sounds really amazing. Um, and so then, and then the far future, if we could like, look out into space and find a region that, that, that Carina will look like in the far future, what, what might we see? So there we start to imagine things like the, the Hyades cluster here in the northern hemisphere. These, this is an open cluster that has time, had time to spread itself out as it orbits around and around the Milky Way. Except this is that system times eight because there's so many open clusters embedded within the Great Korean Nebula. Now, what, what's going to be amazing though is, is the process to get there. We know of at least Eta Carina is probably not just going to go supernova, but it's going to go hypernova when it explodes, um, letting off this amazing gamma ray burst in the process. We don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, various people have said it's probably going to happen in the next few years. That's actually probably not true. So if, if you've heard the rumor, Eta Carina is going to go any day now, uh, that rumor is based off of the fact that We've observed other stars that undergo these false supernova events where it, it looks like they're going supernova and then the star stays together. Well, in the other cases where we've seen that, in one instance, there was the false supernova and then two years later, the full-blown supernova. But that star where that was seen was much more advanced than Eta Carina. So there's, there's the likelihood that Eta Carina is going to trick us a few more times finally go and in the process clear out the space around it, completely destroying the homunculus, rearranging the inside of the Great Korean Nebula. Each of these supernova has the potential to clear out a region, creating an empty bubble in this giant gas complex. And in some of the more detailed images, um, astronomers have actually seen a lot of these bubbles all throughout some of these, these nebulae. Yeah. And, and so if you want to take a look at these bubbles, uh, you want to take a look at Spitzer's infrared images. And there, there's just absolutely amazing images across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, across all the different colors of light of this system. Um, there, there's also interesting time variation. Uh, I'm going to keep harking back to Eta Carina because really it is the coolest thing in this system. Yeah. And uh, it, it's actually a binary system with a 5.2 year period. And so as you watch it in the x-ray over time, you can see its variations. As you watch it in light, uh, visible light over time, you see these variations. Um, so as you step through the different colors of the electromagnetic spectrum, you see in visible light the keyhole nebula, which is a dark, uh, particularly opaque pocket of gas that makes it look like someone's taken a chunk out of the luminous material. Uh, it's just blocked it out with dust. But as you start looking in the infrared light that's able to penetrate this dust, you start to see it open up and you're able to see a lot more stars. As you move into the millimeter, you start to see more and more star formation occurring. If you go the other direction looking at high energy light, as you look at it in the x-ray, you see all of these supernovae that have gone off. Um, all these different colors put together are what allow us to get the complete understanding of this amazing system. Now you said that Eta Carina is, is not going to blow right away, but I think we, in earlier podcasts we've sort of alluded to that it's pretty much ready to go off. So is that, is there, has there been new science that's come out at this point? Um, we're just starting to understand more and more about, well, these fake nebula as they were. So when, when people say... Sorry, did you, did you mean fake supernova? Yes, yeah, sorry, fake supernova, okay. false supernova. Do you want to 
correct yeah, it, correct let me start that again. So, so as we're learning more and more about these false supernovae, we're starting to understand what differentiates them from one another. We, we've now observed a handful of them, and we're starting to get a better sense of what stage in their evolution these different stars are in. And it looks like, and we can get proven wrong at any instant, the universe is the final determiner. Uh, it looks like Eta Crean is probably a young enough Wolf Ray star that um, it, it's probably good for a few more false alarms in its future. Can, like, but what does that mean? How many years? Give me a date. I, I can't do it. Sorry. So, ten, so the, the, the ten years? A hundred no, years? No, the, the papers. Thousand I'm, years? Well, probably thousands of years. The papers. How many thousands? At, a hundred thousand? No, we don't know. Okay, I don't like that answer. <laughs> I want to know. Um, <clears throat> Fine. And it could always just decide to prove us all wrong and explode tomorrow. But the papers I've been looking at say it's not imminent. It's it's probably on the thousands of year time scale. Okay. All right. All right. I'll I'll let that slide. <laughs> um, now <clears throat> now you mentioned a few things already. You mentioned you know if we look at we can look at Eta Carina, we can look at the Keyhole Nebula. If you you know get in really detail, what are some of the really prominent features in the Carina Nebula itself? It, it's really the Keyhole Nebula is the big one to look at. Eta Carina is the big one to look at. But beyond that, if you really just want a really stunning, pretty picture, um, use a telescope that has a low focal ratio so that you have a nice, big field of view. And take a look at the full complex. It's, it's this beautiful, to me, it looks kind of like an orchid. It's this beautiful structure where on one side it has kind of a triangle of brightly glowing material that fades away from the center. And then on the bottom, it, you can almost see, well, depending on how you flip the photo, you can almost see like the petal of an orchid coming out of the center where it's kind of dark in the middle of the petal with bright edges. Um, it's just this absolutely stunning reddish region where all of this hydrogen gas is being excited and we get to benefit from the excited gas. Now, are there any other deep sky objects around the constellation that might be interesting? Well, as I said, there's the eight open clusters, which which are all worth looking at. And they're all slightly different ages, ranging from three million years out to about ten million years. They're all rich in very bright blue stars. And just jumping back and forth between them and seeing how one class of object can have so many slightly different appearances is one of the fun things with this nebula. And one of my favorite things to look at with a telescope is double stars. Are there any double stars? Oh, I'm sure there are, but I didn't prepare that. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'll give you the answer because I do know. Okay. Go so for it. There's Epsilon Carinae and Upsilon. They're both double stars visible in small telescopes. Okay. And there's also a globular cluster there, too, NGC 2808. Why do the sources I'm looking at not list these things? Sorry, now you uh, get to see all those moments where Fraser and I have moments of, huh, okay. And also, I, I thought, did I to talk about the meteor showers that come out of there, too? Right. The, the Eta Koreans is the big one. Yeah. That's January? Uh, yeah, January. Okay. So I'll ask you about that, too. Okay. Go for it. I said, do you want to, do you want to answer the question that I asked you about, about uh, whether there are any double stars? So it was Eps, and what was the other one? Uh, Eps and Ups. Eps and ups, okay. Yeah, and there's also a globular cluster, too. Okay, sorry, Preston, we're going to torture you today. Yeah. So, so there's, there's actually two different uh, double, double star systems in this. There's the Epsilon and Upsilon, just, just to make them rhyme. Epsilon and Upsilon Carini double stars, which, which are always good to look at with a powerful enough uh, telescope. Beyond that, there's also one globular cluster, which y you're peering through all the gas and dust. So it still looks good, but... I'm much more into the open clusters in front of it. And one thing that we all can see is there's a meteor shower that comes out of the Carina constellation. That's the Eta Carinids. Eta Carinids, and yeah. those occur every January. So January is just a month of meteors. Uh, go out, look up, and all because the meteors appear to be radiating away from the Carina nebula doesn't mean that you can't see them all over the planet when it's dark outside. That's right, yeah. And so <clears throat> you might not see the constellation where they appear to be coming from, but they're kind of roughly pointing in that direction. So I guess if you want to find Karina, right, wait till January, wait till the, nebula, the meteor shower <laughs> is happening, and then follow the source of the meteors until you can get back to the source. 
Yeah, that, that seems to be the strangest way possible to find a, a, a <laughs> constellation. I much more recommend getting yourself yeah. a copy of Stellarium or a yeah. planisphere or something like that. Searching for a, a pot uh, at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> exactly. So when was Korea going to blow again? Ida Karina? I forget. Yeah, what we don't say? know. We oh, don't know. All right. All right. All right. Well, thanks a lot for all that information, Pamela, and we'll talk to you next week. Okay. Sounds great, Fraser. Now, this doesn't mean you should all leave. This just means Fraser and I need to save our files. So there's going to be a pause for saving at this moment. And I'm going to open up the comment reel so that I can start looking at all the questions you guys have been posting. All right. I'm saved. I'm saved, too. Okay, good. Um, and then what I'll do is I will post a link to the Hangout itself into the chat. And then if people want to jump in and ask us some questions, you can. <coughs> um, uh, and then if anybody, let's see where that is. All right, so I'm going to add the, the link to the Hangout itself. Now, now keep in mind, so what this means is um, you're going to be hopping into the show and become the sort of peanut gallery along with us as we, as we hang out. And we'll hang out for, you know, however and long we people want to. We expect you to ask questions, or we will stare at yeah, you and possibly and, mock and you. Interact. We'll just give you an uncomfortable silence if you don't <laughs> want to interact with us. But also, if you have any questions, you can ask. You can ask some questions in the hangout itself. Um, oh, <laughs> Pam, uh, so uh, Jens Riggelson is asking for Pamela to say this episode of Astronomy Cast. Do so you want to just say that right now? Although we, it's actually pre-recorded and gets put in because of the sponsor, but. You could say this episode of Astronomy Cast was brought to you by, uh, I don't know, Google Plus. This episode, <laughs> this episode of Astronomy Cast has been brought to you by Google Plus. There you go. <laughs> Is that what you wanted, Jens? So if any, if anyone else wants to jump in, I've posted a link to it, and we've got somebody's kitchen. I wins there. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in and say hi? Um, and again, if you've been watching this, uh, if you could press plus one on the episode, then we can know how many people are watching this episode compared to other times. I think we kind of forgot to mention it in all of our usual channels. We probably have less people watching today than we usually do. Yeah. Um, let me see if there's any more questions. And we completely forgot to mention the survey. So for those of you who are, yeah, so remember the, the research survey I mentioned to you. You, all right, lot, you say a lot of stuff to me, and I forget it all. <laughs> no, no, I know what That's you're That's all right. I'll post it up in the comments. So uh, a number of years back, for those of you who are around way back in the past, we did a research survey to find out why it is all of you wonderful people are out there. And I use this to try and improve the show and help people understand the effects of podcasting. Um, I'm posting a link to it in the comments. And if all of you could go take that survey, um, I'd really, really appreciate it. And I'll spread it around on social media. And if you all can spread it around on social media, the goal is to get Astronomy Cast listeners um, to respond to this. If they're not an Astronomy Cast listener, it would kind of lead to very odd data. Uh, now, in the questions, um, Beth Katz uh, asked, um, are the stars in this constellation at roughly the same distance, or are they just in the same area by our line of sight? The stars in the nebula, which is not all the stars in the constellation, the stars in the nebula are all at roughly the same distance, that 6,500 to 10,000 light years. Um, but within the constellation, there's a few rogues that aren't at that distance. Yeah, like with any constellation, the distance to the stars in the constellation are completely arbitrary, and they only look collected because of our, our point of view. Um, uh, no, Bill <coughs> Dizelli asks, can questions be about something other than Karina? Absolutely. You can oh, ask yes, totally. questions about anything. And we got, got Allie Marie. Is that right? Hi. How's it going? Did you have a question for us? Um, yeah, I was wondering kind of like, I sort of understand the like full supernova thing, but do we know like how that works? The the full supernovae? Yeah. Uh, no, it's very very confusing. It seems to be some sort of an effect where part of the star starts to explode, but the process disrupts and doesn't have enough energy to shred the star. 
<laughs> so it's yeah, it, it's it, if you know anything about cataclysmic variables, this is where you have a white dwarf star that builds up material on the surface of the star, and the stuff that it builds up on the surface um, eventually gets dense enough that, that it can undergo nuclear reactions and burst, or you can also get a disk of material around a, a white dwarf and the disk gets um, dense enough to undergo nuclear reactions. There's various ways of, of causing things to go boom. Um, with, with these so false nebulae, it appears to be something with the outer part of the star undergoes a similar process, and we've now lost Fraser. Uh, the outer part of the star undergoes a very similar process, but beyond that, we don't really know. Why did the sucker not fully explode? Not sure. Still working on it. Okay, cool. So other questions out there? Pamela. Yes. If I were standing on the moon, and yep. uh, hey, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> so that I had to, the sun was shining on me. <clears throat> which, if I were standing on the moon, which never happens here. But <laughs> okay, so standing on the moon. Yeah, and I would look at the the Earth. Yes. Would it seem as big to me as when I'm looking to the moon from here? No, it would actually appear a lot larger. So the the way to think of it is. Um, the separation between the two is the same. The size of the objects is very different. So if, if you're looking at a child in the distance, the child will appear smaller than you will appear to the child looking in opposite directions. So since, since the Earth is much bigger than the Moon, when you're on the Moon looking at the Earth, you still see the Earth is looking bigger. Uh, distances stay the same, so the relative sizes stay the same on the sky. All right. Thanks. And you can see the difference when the uh, during a lunar eclipse, you can see how the moon takes a long time to pass through the shadow of the through the Earth's shadow. So the way to think of it is, you're going from moon fits under your thumb to Earth fits under your fist. Uh, Tim Tuck Tim Tuck asks, when Eta Carina goes boom, will it be a daylight event? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Not as interesting as having a bloody shoulder on uh, on Orion, but uh, yeah, so there will be a bright red light at the front of the keel of the ship. And it will be visible during the day. Oh, Carver, you have feedback. That's okay. Ask your question and then mute your feedback. Okay. okay. Sorry, I have headphones in. Uh, yeah, it's just computer system. No, once you talk, it usually figures it out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I was going to ask, though, having been to both the southern and the northern hemisphere, do you find that observing conditions are usually better in one as opposed to the other? Um, for better or worse, the southern hemisphere has fewer people living in it, which means your likelihood of finding dark sites is much higher. So uh, if you go to the middle of Australia, nothing there. You go to a lot of Africa, nothing there. Um, South America tends to be better populated, but it's not as horribly light pollu polluted as, as North America. Um, so simply by the virtue of having fewer human beings, uh, you're able to get some pretty amazing observing conditions. The, the other nice thing that you have going in the Southern Hemisphere is the Atacama Desert, which is about as dry as it can possibly get. Rainfall gets measured in a couple of millimeters a year. And wow. that leads to pretty awesome observing. Uh, we just don't have any deserts that amazing and isolated in the, the northern hemisphere. Yeah, and the clear skies in the world are in Antarctica. Yeah, that's true. Um, so Albert McClellan wanted you to mention the difference between a supernova and a hypernova. <laughs> OK. So a hypernova is a class of supernova. Um, so supernovae come in a whole variety. Uh, in general, there's type 1A, which is where you have a white dwarf sucking material off of a partner star until it gets too much material and goes kaplooey. Um, beyond that, you have a variety of different types of novae that involve a single giant star exploding. Um, type 2 is, is the most common of these. Um, in some cases, with these giant star going kablooey, 
the mass is so great and some combination of magnetic fields and other things we're still trying to figure out causes large amounts of the high energy part of, of this explosion to get channeled along the uh, poles of the star. And these channels uh, in the poles, or jets, uh, they focus the light into what we see as gamma ray bursts if they're pointed straight at us. Now, as far as we know, Eta Carina not pointed at us, pointed at an angle going past us. So we will not get hit with the gamma ray burst when it decides to go off. And Jay Cross has joined us. And for those of you who don't know, Jay is one of the administrators for the uh, Bad Astronomy Universe Today Forum. So a great contributor to the community. And I believe he's got a question for us. Oh, you're muted. We can't hear you, Jay. And I have a question for you. I want to know if you actually use that wall as a green screen. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes. Um, uh, I use the wall as a green screen. Uh, in my non-astronomy job, what I do is uh, video training where I, where I uh, communicate with people on very technical subject, and I use the green screen uh, behind me as a space for doing green screen work. Very cool. Okay. So uh, the question that I had for you uh, had to do with the metallicity of the new stars in the uh, Carina Nebula. Uh, is it uh, significantly higher than the solar metallicity? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. And um, on a related topic, whether it is or isn't, um, does that, if it is more metallic, does that um, slow down the rate at which these stars will grow and eventually explode for their given mass, um, or does it speed it up? So, so I know that their metallicity uh, is is. I mean, they're metal-rich stars in the process of forming. I don't know exactly where it is relative to solar. Um, the sun is a particularly metal-rich star. I just, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know its, it's metallicity other than it is population one metallicity star off the top of my head. We pretty much run most of our models for how supernova are going off using population one metallicity stars in the model simply because those are the stars that are around and are still young enough to explode. So uh, the models that we work on will, give or take the details, all be accurate for the stars that are forming within this system. OK, thanks. Uh, Beth Katz wants to know if Betelgeuse is going to go supernova before Eta Carina. Now that we know um, when Eta Carina is going to happen, <laughs> which is what? Tomorrow? Is that right? No, that no. Uh, these, these are two completely different types of stars. Uh, so you have you have Eta Carina is a luminous blue variable star, a uh, Wolf Ray type star. It's going to have one type of a supernova. Uh, Betelgeuse is a nice giant red star, and it's going to have a completely different type of supernova. Um, yeah, it's it's anyone's guess which one goes first. I think modern guesses are mostly leaning towards Betelgeuse, but not all of them are leaning towards Betelgeuse. So yeah, take a bet. Um, is it Kieran Rain, I think? Uh, when will the last few episodes be up on iTunes? So sorry about that. There's a bit of a delay now sort of in, in all of the process. But um, I think we're going to post another episode. So OK, so long story short, um, our web server got a virus on it. Yes. And so we've been really, it kind of broke. And people who were going to our web server were getting a warning. Some people were getting a warning that there was some it's kind of It's fixed virus. now. It's so now it's fixed, fixed. Now. We've moved to a completely different location. We've, we're repairing everything. And, and that's kind of taken up a bunch of time. We haven't wanted to post the new episodes. And so although we've got the video versions, we haven't posted the audio versions into it. But we're, we're now starting to catch all that back up. But the plan is you know, once we get everything all figured out, is we're going to do these. These episodes will actually be a week in advance. So although we said today it was the 16th, we're going to probably do them one week in advance. And then that'll give us time to get the audio version all ready, and it'll all go live nicely at, at the same time. And, but if and it's want not preview, they can watch the video on, on YouTube. It's not as dire as Fraser's making it say. We have episode 245 is posted. Episode 246, which we recorded last Monday, will go live today. So we're running a one-week lag between the episode that's online and the episode we're in the process of recording, plus or minus a few hours. So we're recording episode 247 this a few hours. Yeah. 
And so and two forty and so all of these now are all on on YouTube as well. You know, you can you can look at the stream. So you will get a sneak preview, I guess. Like once, you know, we're gonna record the live video and then post it on YouTube right away and then there will be a lag and then if you want to get the audio. I, I totally get that that getting your podcasts on your through iTunes or on your you know your podcatcher is the most convenient way to receive them. Um, and so I know by recording these videos, we've kind of made things a little more complicated for some people if they want to try and gather all the astronomy casts they can. <laughs> but, but I think in the, you know, in the end, being able to do this live and interact with people, and that's better. And so hopefully everything at the end will be better. We're doing some of the pieces will be a little more complicated. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, I had another I question, too, kind of following up on Jay's question. Okay. Um, and so does the density at which these stars are forming together in these different nebulae affect how many planets are formed around these stars, or do we even know yet? There, there's models trying to figure this out. Um, I personally don't trust any planetary, net, any planetary formation models yet, because we haven't figured out how to get Jupiters next to stars real easily. Um, it, as near as we can tell, giant star forming regions like this are, are likely to be forming planets around every single star. It's, it's kind of awesome. Um, Jeremy Coppin asked a pretty interesting question. He said, on partly cloudy nights, the stars between clouds seem brighter and clear. Is this an illusion or is the seeing really better? It depends on the type of star. Th this is uh, not type of star, uh, the type of cloud. On the nights where you get the cirrus, which is the um, thin, annoying cloud that just sort of appears. Um, cirrus appears when you have clear, stable skies and obliterates the clear part of the still sky. But if you have gaps in the cirrus, the stars that appear in those gaps are going to be experiencing less seeing. Now, if it's a blustery storm in the process of blowing in, then everything goes to pot. Um, so it, it can be a matter that, yes, because of the type of cloud you have, you have atmospheric conditions that are perfectly still, and that leads to beautiful, not particularly twinkling stars. I know. I think I know what, he's, what he means, though. And I wonder if it has something to do with like the light pollution, like some of the light pollution is getting blocked by the, by the clouds or something. You know what I mean? No. So well, I, I just know what he's talking about, that you go out and you see part, you know, big puffy clouds that are blocking out chunks of the sky, but the, but the parts that are still peeking out look really crisp and clear. Maybe it's just a trick of your mind, but I know what he's talking about. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly Sorry. you don't, so I'm a crazy person. So, but I'm with you, Jeremy. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. I um, saw an interesting question in, uh, on the list of questions where somebody was saying about the supernova explosions. That, uh, this is sort of a common question I get a lot. Since the supernova are, you know, stars that are, you know, combining heavier and heavier elements, and they're about to start creating iron, um, and that the creating of the iron is is uh, what causes some of these supernova to go. Can't we just look at the spectrum? Whoa! So if you're feedbacking really badly. Um, All right, I'll mute my mic. Can't can't we just look at the spectrum of the star? And, no. Uh, I I know the answer to that, but I'll let you answer because uh, uh, it's your show. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the 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 plain and simple answer is no. Uh, when we look at stellar spectra, what we're seeing is the atmosphere on the outside of a star, um, and all of the cool nuclear reactions and stuff and stuff are going down deep below that atmosphere, and and so it's sort of like if if you were able to measure the composition of my shirt, that wouldn't tell you anything about the composition of my stomach. Um, the, two, the two are very separate and there's multiple layers between them and you just can't understand what's inside one by understanding what's inside the other. There you go. Uh, Jay Graff wanted to know if we're going to do a show on the conservation of angular momentum. See, I, I we keep getting that one. It, maybe I don't know. It, it's it's one of those things that just yeah. It's hard. It's hard. You know, there's a lot of topics that would be a great five minute show. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so a lot of the times we're always tr thinking of some way that we can connect things together into a bigger show. You know, and so for example, individual nebulae. 
you know, individual, neb yeah, might not be a really good show, but maybe if we did like a whole bunch of them all in one show, or if we're doing right. constellations, that lets us talk about, you know, would it be cool to have a show on this specific globular cluster? Well, no, you know, that would be five <laughs> minutes, one minute, but yeah. but that way, you know, so a lot of times if we can think of a way to kind of connect these things together, we'll try and do a show and include some of those physics topics. Um, yeah, so Jens is, Jens is agreeing with me here. Uh, he says, doesn't the rain clear the air of dust? And I think that's what he's driving at. If you have like a nice big rainstorm and then it's starting to break up and the sky is clear because the, the, the dust has been cleared out of the sky. I guess yeah. I've just never been somewhere where that was a concern. He can join our club too. Um, all right. Let's see if there are any more questions. Did anyone else have a question here? Um, okay, Amit's got a brutal one for you, so maybe we'll just, this will just take the rest of the uh, of the show. So Amit Kale, and Amit uh, is was the astronomer who provided us the amazing view of Saturn on Saturday night. So uh, the least we can do is answer his question. Um, so as we know, our universe is about 13.7 billion years old, but the observable universe is much larger than its age. So its diameter is something around 93 billion light years. So we also know that nothing is faster than light. So how can it be possible that the universe is 93 billion light years across when the universe is only 13.7 billion years old? And nothing so can move faster than the speed of light. So, so there's a difference between something moving the speed of light and space expanding so that things appear to move faster than the speed of light. Um, the, the way to think of this is uh, I may be limited to being able to run a nine minute mile. I don't know if I can actually do that, but I'll, I'll think I'll, I'll think positive thoughts. I might possibly be able to run, one, to run a nine minute mile. Now if you put me on a moving walkway, and that moving walkway is moving at 18 miles per hour, then, then you have to add my ability to run with how fast the moving walkway is going. And stars in space, galaxies in space, um, they're not so much on a moving walkway, but they're getting moved by the new stuff in space coming out and pushing them. It, well, it's not coming out. That was just a total misconception I inadvertently sp spread. As, as the universe grows, it, it's not actually having stuff spurred in. That was the steady state model. As the universe grows and nothing ends up between these two objects except additional space, it's as though they're both on moving walkways that are carrying them apart. And while they're still limited in their motion relative to the grid of space to going the speed of light or slower, um, the fact that they're on these moving walkways of expanding universe allows them to appear to move faster than they can as individual objects move relative to space. And this is something that's going to happen probably in the far future is that as dark energy is accelerating the expansion of the universe, you're going to get this situation where distant galaxies are moving away from us faster than the speed of light. And, and that's already happening. We just can't see them because they're kind of beyond the horizon right. of where and we can so, see. And so the horizon, that horizon of what we can see, is just, you know, the light from those galaxies is never going to reach us. Yeah. But, but does you know, that, that 93 billion light years across, I mean, a lot of that was inflation. I mean, a lot of that size was yeah. defined within the first few moments after the Big Bang. Well, so, so inflation actually just bloated us up to the size of, of, of the solar system. Um, so, so it's actually the entire universe continuing to expand over time that has gotten us to where we are. Right, oh, okay. that, that 93 billion is um, the current size, current in some sense, size of the observable universe. Yeah. And the, uh, the inflated universe... Uh, the entire universe, if we could ever see the whole thing, we have no idea how big that is. Right? That, that, that could be thousands of times bigger, could be trillions of times bigger, could be 20% bigger. We don't know. Yeah, so, so we are speaking strictly in terms of the visible universe. Yeah, that's the observable universe, is the 93 billion. Yeah. Right. Cool. And I think we did a whole episode on this called How Big is the Universe? Yeah. Um... Yeah, Beth, wants, Beth Katz suggested that we have some kind of pictures and diagrams. Absolutely, and that's just a, you know, we can screen share into this Hangout 
And if we were even more organized, we'd have a bunch of pictures and stuff that we could, I would be throwing in pictures while we're having the conversation. And that's just another level of coordination that I'll, I'll get on top of. We get so, there. so you have to remember, this is still a volunteer activity where neither of us are earning money. <laughs> right, right. But, <laughs> so yeah. the time we spend doing this is time we don't sleep because we love all of you enough that we don't sleep to do this. But yeah, no, I think getting that kind of stuff organized, being able to put in images and stuff into the show while we do it would be really cool. And especially for the final, you know, it wouldn't happen in necessarily the audio version, but the people who are watching it would be able to, to see it and the stuff on the YouTube afterwards would be cool. So, yeah. so that's definitely part of the plan. It's just trying to figure out a way that we can switch that stuff up. And I don't know if it's happening anymore, but in the past, my picture doesn't grow for anybody else outside of the podcast. And so if I was, say, displaying pictures while Pamela was talking, they'd be tiny little thumbnails and yeah. wouldn't actually show up. And so there's a way for me to con control the camera and direct back and forth. And you know, we're, we're learning as we go. This is all experimentation. So, so yeah, absolutely. We, we, want to do it. we actually tried that out in the, the first weekly space hangout that we did. We, I had a bunch of cool animations that I was displaying while we were talking. Yeah. But I forgot to click on them, and so they just were really small. So, <laughs> but uh, we'll figure it out. And actually, you know, when we did the, uh, the the virtual star party, I had Stellarium going. And so then while we were talking about things, I was switching back to my view of Stellarium and rotating the sky around and showing what we were going to look at next. And that worked out really well, yeah. except there was a weird flicker going on from the hangout trying to get through my screen. So anyway, it's, uh, you know, it's all in bits and pieces. If, I mean, again, if, if anyone has any suggestions of any way that we can improve the process, we're all ears. I mean, yeah. we are, as you said, you are watching us figure this out, but we figure, you know, better this than nothing, better this than us just sort of waiting and avoiding the technology. Yeah. This this hangout lets us just do, do it without a 10 times investment in our, in our time compared to the audio. Now it's, you know, it's only a little harder to do than the audio, which is exactly, yeah. you know, what we want. But I will never be preparing a PowerPoint for every single astronomy cast that's filled with images. No, no, but, but you know, <laughs> maybe we can get it done on the side or have somebody else do it. You know, we'll figure it out. Anyway, thank you for the feedback. We appreciate it. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, my window, so my window does pop up now, John? That's perfect. Okay, good. Um... Okay, good. Well, I don't see... Oh, um, Nitem wants to get... So, uh, yeah, so if anyone wants to join the Hangout and ask a question, I posted a link to the question further up, to, to the actual Hangout itself, and I'll post it again just at the bottom of the, uh, of the thread. So if anybody else wants to jump in, ask us any questions, now's your chance. Otherwise, I think things are starting to wrap up and we can kind of shut this down. So you guys already did a video about uh, the size of the universe? Yeah, we did. Not yeah, we did a. We did uh, audio. We did a trilogy of, of four parts. So we so did. Kind of fine mode. Uh, well, if you do a, the the easiest way to get every episode of Astronomy Cast is to subscribe on iTunes, and then you'll get the full list of all 250 episodes plus all the question shows, and then you can just go through the topics and download the actual ones that are interesting to you. Uh, you can also grab, our, we have an archive page, but the archive page actually is out of date, which needs to be updated. Um, and then the other way to do it is actually just to go into our, if you go to the podcast.xml, if you go to astronomycast.com slash podcast.xml, even in a web browser, that'll take you to the full list of episodes, and you can just pick the ones that you want to listen to. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we'll wrap this up then. So thanks, Pamela, and thanks to our to our special guests for joining us for this episode. And thanks for actually asking questions. That was awesome. I really appreciate that. Um, and then, so then again, the next thing to watch is we're going to try and do another virtual star party or two this week, probably within the next, I'm not sure what days. It all depends on the astronomers. And then we're going to be doing the roundtable for the weekly space hangout, and that's going to be on Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 12 Central, one Eastern London time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And don't forget to go take the survey that we're linking to in our Google Plus and Twitter accounts. All right. do, you have a, do you have an anticipated topic for the next podcast? Not yet. No. Okay. <laughs> As we do, sometimes we know what they're going to be. I, I, I threw a list of about 20 topics at Pamela. 
and then we take them in the order that she wants. No, he threw a list of about ten topics at me, and we've already discarded one of them and oh, have two we? of them. Yeah. Oh, all right. I have other lists I've sent you to, so yeah, we've got <laughs> lots of topics. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to shut this broadcast down. We'll talk to you all later.